Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you about bus driving. These are options available to CDL drivers that are considering a career as a bus driver in the different careers that you could possibly entertain. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about the different careers that you could possibly do as a bus driver. There's lots of options for you in terms of driving a bus. You're not just stuck with driving a school bus or driving for Greyhound or driving transit. There's different opportunities available to you as a bus driver. I'm just checking out the color and the lighting here. It seems to be uh, a little bit, no, I think it's all right. Anyway, we're here and uh, if you're new, to Smart Drive Test, consider subscribing, uh, consider leaving a comment or sharing the videos here on social media. All of that helps us out. And if you're watching on the replay, do the same as well. And for those of you who are tuning in live here, Super Chat is available. We'll answer any questions that you have about passing a road test, regardless of class, regardless of license, regardless of where you are in the world or how old you are. Smart Drive Test can help you pass a road test and stay safe on the road roadways. Uh, Corey is here, Brooks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator and helps to keep everything running smoothly. Keeps out the spammers and as well, any videos that I suggest, Corey gets those up for you as well. So lots of good information here. And it is daylight savings time. So be careful on the road today and take note that it is in fact daylight savings time. And that will kind of screw up people's little biological clocks. I know I got up this morning and it was a little bit odd. So uh, if you are tuning in here, let us know where you're tuning fr in from in the world and let us know what class of license you're going for as well. If you're on the replay, uh, again, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world and let us know uh, what class of license that you're going for. And uh, driving lessons by Big Mac Sam. Uh, Sam is in New York City in the Bronx working for Rookie Auto Driving School. Sam is a driving instructor and he's been a long time supporter of the Smart Drive Test channel here. So if you're in New York City, look up Sam and he'll definitely help you out. And Corey is in Winnipeg. Is it actually beginning to be spring in Winnipeg, Winnipeg there, Corey? Uh, I know that it's beginning to be, be spring here and behind me here, I'm hoping shortly that I can change the shelves to springtime for driving and we'll definitely try and change that out uh, soon here in the next couple of weeks at least I'm hoping that's what's gonna happen so yes uh, and just bear with me here I need to go over and just get the slide presentation ready I didn't I failed to do that when I got started here so there we go uh, nope just about there there we go okay so back over here and yes Presentations by bus drivers. This is for CDL drivers and just my own personal story uh, when I got started driving Truck I drove truck in the 1990s. I moved to Australia in the early 2000s and I didn't want to go back driving truck anymore I'd done quite a bit of research moving from Canada to Australia and I looked at uh, The roads in Australia and I was I was seriously to consider driving truck because I was gonna go to university there And I knew I was gonna have to work for a bit to make enough money to go to university and when I was working in Canada uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, I was making 32 cents a mile, which is a pretty, you know, at that time was a fairly decent amount of money for a truck driver over the road. And I could make fairly decent miles, probably 750, 800 miles uh, in a day driving truck. So, you know, I was making three or four hundred dollars a day driving truck in the early 2000s. And when I moved to Australia, I knew I was going to have to go to work. So I started investigating the trucking industry in Australia and it was 32 cents a kilometer. But I soon realized when I was looking at the roadways and those types of things, it's not like the interstate system in the United States of America. It's all these two lane windy roads through these little country towns in the outback of Australia. And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to make the same amount of money uh, in Australia driving truck as I was here in North America. So what I did, was I considered going and driving coach and I ended up driving coach for Greyhound uh, out of Melbourne into Canberra and into Sydney and then the uh, Brisbane run we took it took the bus halfway up to uh, Parks New South Wales so that's how I got into driving bus because I just didn't I was kind of at the end of my driving career for trucking 
I just didn't want to drive truck anymore. And so I thought, you know, go off and drive bus and, and do that. So I did that for a year full time and then I did it part time for three years. And as well, I drove uh, for V-Line, which is one of the, you know, interstate uh, bus lines there as well. And uh, I did a little bit, probably a couple of months, I worked for a tour company as well. So I have a little bit of experience driving tour buses, but not a great deal. And Corey says that in Winnipeg there, <laughs> it's minus seven degrees Celsius and it's a warm day for him. Uh, minus seven degrees Celsius is about uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's actually quite, quite cold for the most, for the rest of us. But there in Winnipeg, it's fairly warm. So. So that's how I got into driving buses. I really enjoyed driving buses. Uh, I like the passengers, I like the meal breaks. Uh, it was the biggest transition for me coming from driving truck to driving coaches was working on a schedule because when I drove truck, you were just you know going all the time. And when I was driving coaches, you had to go to a certain point uh, on a schedule. And that was, that was a big transition for me. <laughs> I realized, you know, because when I drove truck, I just drove, drank coffee all the time. But when I started driving buses, because uh, <laughs> uh, I knew I had to go to the toilet, I, you know, coffee makes me pee. So I knew that when I was stopping at the at the rest breaks, that I could only have half a cup of coffee, and that was it. In order for me to be able to make the uh, to make the next meal break without having to stop on the bus. So that was the other thing that was a bit of a transition for me as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hillbilly, uh, if you're PhD, why not be instructor or consultant? Actually, uh, Hillbilly, the other thing that I do, as well as I do consulting work, I do post-crash investigation consulting work for the law firm, so I do that as well. And, you know, uh, I was an instructor, but um, I was a professor at the university, but, you know, some things just don't fit. And uh, that didn't, I, you know, I taught at the university for five years and the university is a different, it's a different animal in and of itself. And that's the reason that I don't teach at university. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna get over to the PowerPoint presentation here and I'll get going with that. So bear with me here while I just get over there and get going here. Okay, so bus driving careers. This is me, Rick August with a PhD. Yes, I do have a PhD. I graduated from the University of Melbourne in 2006. Uh, I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, during that time, I also worked uh, as a driver rehabilitation specialist working with people with disabilities to get them back to driving. People who had debilitating injuries, stroke and those types of things and help people learn to drive with hand controls. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a PhD in legal history. And uh, for those of you who don't know, legal history is a study of courts, policing, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing, oddly enough, as it relates to traffic. Uh, during my time at the uni in Melbourne, Australia, I drove, excuse me, for Greyhound and for the regional bus line there, the V line, as I already mentioned in the introduction. Okay, the video I got up this week was some dash cam footage that Esther sent in, a smart driver of a rear end crash she had on a freeway and I gave some tips and, and strategies for you to put in place that you could prevent yourself rear ending other traffic and essentially it's about space management, backing off, getting lots of space between you and the vehicles in front and reading the signs on the roadway. So have a look at that video if you haven't done that already and as well I put that together in a playlist, uh, rear ending, rear end types of crashes and uh, if you head over to the Smart Drive Test website, you can pick up the defensive driving course for $17, and Corey will put that in the description for you as well. Uh, in the defensive driving course, rear end is only one of the types of crashes that you could potentially could be involved in. In the defensive driving course, we talk about the four different types of crashes that you could potentially be involved in on the roadway. A head-on collision, sideswipe crashes, T-bone crashes, which are probably now the most deadly types of crashes because there's simply no protection in the vehicle, and rear-end crashes. So we talk about all of that in the defensive driving course. So for those of you who are looking for a job as a career uh, driving a bus or a truck, either one, this video will help you out. There's also a couple of other types of videos here on job search, uh, writing uh, resumes and cover letters and those types of things. And you know, with any type of 
activity in our lives when we're trying to make money we're venturing into our own business we're changing jobs we're getting retraining those types of things there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of trepidation a lot of fear and I can understand all that because three years ago uh, you know I was working at the truck driving school uh, lost my job uh, I started the YouTube channel and you know uh, I can remember vividly saying to a friend of mine nobody's ever gonna watch this <clears throat> information and I'll tell you boy was I wrong because I mean we're quickly uh, you know moving in on 100,000 subscribers here on the YouTube channel and it's it's been wildly more successful than I ever could have imagined so when you're changing careers when you're moving forward with your life rather than saying what if you know what if everything goes wrong and what if I end up being a, you know a bag person out on the street pushing a shopping cart why don't you say what if everything goes right and my life is so much better because it's not just me there are all kinds of other success stories out there so with a bit of optimism a bit of work and you know some <clears throat> guidance from other people you too can be successful especially in a career as as, uh, as a bus driver or a truck driver the return on investment is very high for a few weeks at a truck driving school uh, getting your license your CDL license you can be very successful and go on to a career uh, these are just some of them taxi drivers limousine drivers you could be a transit bus driver school bus driver you could drive a tour coach or you could work for Greyhound as a bus driver there's a lot there are lots and lots of options available to you so what you're going to need is you're going to need a class two or four license uh, if you're working on the letter system depending on the state or province in which you are in it's going to be BCF or and a G license uh, sorry that wasn't a G license um, is it a G license <sighs> province of Ontario <laughs> my apologies it's not G because G is their passenger vehicle there so that's a that's a typo on my part so taxis and buses you're gonna need a learner's permit and then you're going to need to take a practical test on the vehicle you're gonna to have to probably most of these buses now are all gonna have air brakes you're gonna need an air brake ticket and then you're gonna to need to do a road test part of that road test is doing a uh, pre-trip inspection on the vehicle and for the purposes of a bus if it's a, if it's a large full-size bus more than 25 passengers you're gonna to have to do a pre-trip inspection as well so uh, there was a live stream here on transit buses and what it was going to be like to be a transit bus driver uh, it's pretty hard to get into these positions as a transit bus driver you will have to do a fair bit of work and be qualified and transit authorities now in this day and age are mostly looking for attitude and drivers and operators that are going to be able to provide customer service they're not really looking for you to have a driver's license already because they can teach that uh, you're gonna work probably 10 or 15 years before you become a senior driver and you're on a steady shift uh, in the beginning you're gonna be working split shifts and essentially what you're gonna do is work during rush hour in the morning and then you're gonna go home for four hours and you come back in the afternoon you're gonna work the rush hour shift and unfortunately that's the way it's gonna be you're gonna work a lot of weekends and most of your two days off during are gonna be during the week when you work as a transit authority uh, you will be enrolled in the union there will be benefits the pay is pretty good uh, most transit authorities in Canada are paying somewhere between $25 and $32 an hour. Uh, Sam, I know, was a transit bus operator as well, and Sam will be able to tell you what it is in the States. It's probably comparable in the States. It's probably $20, $25 an hour. Uh, the work hours, as I said, the work hours are not going to be great. Uh, but, you know, uniform, you drive a bus, uh, you deal with passengers, and that is part of what you're going to be doing. And, of course, you're going to be keeping a schedule and those types of things as well. So that's transit bus. The next option is to be a school bus driver. Of course, again, you're going to be working split shift. You're going to pick the kids up in the morning, take them to school, drop them off, and then uh, you're going to go back out in the afternoon. So you're going to go home again for a few hours. It generally tends to be part-time work. One of the things about being a school bus operator is very seldom are you going to work on the weekends unless you're taking the sports team to you know to a game or something like that uh, school bus drivers for the most part you're gonna be dealing with kids teenagers school age children uh, it is somewhat flexible hours as I said it is part-time and a lot of uh, you know tends to be more women who are driving school buses uh, to supplement the family income there is a great deal of responsibility and I'll just point out uh, two of the differences two of the blatant differences between school buses and transit buses school buses stop on the roadway have flashing lights and they work to have uh, maximum visibility because the buses are painted yellow 
for those of you who may or may not know, the yellow taxi cab company in New York City, the owner uh, did test to see what the, the color was that you could see from the farthest distance. And that's why yellow taxi cabs are yellow and school buses are yellow because this, this is the color you can see from the greatest distance. Uh, and so flashing lights, guards, uh, um, cattle guards, lots of mirrors on school buses and they stay on the roadways. Transit buses in opposition, in contrast to school buses, try to get off the road as much as possible into bus bays and those types of things. And the purpose of that is to facilitate traffic flow within the city. So there's two big differences between school buses and transit buses. Transit buses get off the roadway to facilitate traffic flow. School buses actually stop traffic to protect the passengers who are getting on and alighting the bus. All right, a couple of differences there. The next uh, option for bus drivers is driving for Greyhound. And as I said, I have experience, direct experience in driving for Greyhound. Uh, you get a uniform, there's good pay. Uh, when I was working in Australia, I was making $26 an hour driving for Greyhound. There's meal breaks every two to three hours. Uh, you work on a schedule. Uh, one of the things about working for Greyhound as opposed to uh, school buses or transit authorities is that you are gonna work some overnight shifts. So uh, we had a run from uh, Melbourne, Australia into Sydney, Australia and it left at seven o'clock at night and you got in at seven o'clock the next morning. You didn't get in at seven o'clock, you got in at six o'clock and your shift was over at seven. So you work the overnight. Uh, that's one of the things about Greyhound is uh, you're gonna be dealing with that. Uh, you're going to also be dealing with the public. The other thing that I didn't write here uh, with Greyhound is, is that you're going to be dealing with freight as well. And you can see this bus here is pulling a trailer. So this bus here, you're probably going to need a trailer, a heavy trailer endorsement, or you're going to need a class one license to pull a trailer because that trailer uh, is going to have air brakes and it's going to be over 10,000 uh, pounds. You're also with Greyhound, you're going to be doing regional work. You're probably going to be gone for two or three days uh, and then home again. And because you were gone for two or three days and you're working beyond 100 miles of your uh, home terminal, you're also going to be running a logbook as well when you're running for Greyhound. So that's Greyhound. Uh, you're going to stop for meal breaks. <clears throat> Excuse me. You as the driver do get free meals uh, when you stop at the meal breaks. So that's one of the other benefits of working for Greyhound. Uh, you sleep in hotels every night. You get a shower every day, which is kind of nice. <coughs> Excuse me as opposed to being a truck driver where sometimes you don't get a shower for every two or three days. <laughs> so yeah, that was one of the reasons I went off and been, was a truck driver. Tour bus drivers, this is another option. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's have a drink of water here. Tour bus drivers. So this is for tourists who are going on um, and seeing the sites and you're gonna have to do a running commentary while you're doing that. I drove for a short period of time for APT tours in Australia, Australia Pacific tours, APT, yep, Australia Pacific tours, driving the bus to the ferry penguins in uh, on Port Phillip Island. So we would go down and then at sunset, the ferry penguins would come out of the ocean. They'd go out and feed all day in the ocean and they would come back out and then they would, you know, waddle back up to their burrows because they, they slept in burrows at night. And so they had bleachers set up on the beach and the tourists could sit on the bleachers and watch the fairy penguins come up over the beach out of the water. And so we did that. And then, uh, you know, there were a couple of stops along the way. There was a uh, animal farm, a petting zoo there kind of type thing where the tourists could stop in. And of course, there was a souvenir shop there. They could buy souvenirs and those types of things. Uh, and we did get a kickback from the souvenir shop for bringing people in and, you know, to the petting zoo where they had koalas and kangaroos and those types of things. So... Uh, that was that's another option that you could do. I mean, some of these tours can be fairly long. Some of them can just be day tours. Some of them, uh, I I did talk to some of the other drivers while I was working there, and they would be working for APT tours, and they'd be gone for five or six months at a time, uh, taking tours around Australia and those types of things. So you're dealing with people on vacation generally for the most part, you know, who are in good moods and those types of things. And uh, you're going to work odd hours and, you know, some of these tours, depending on where they're going, you know, it can be fairly interesting in terms of getting a bus in, in there and those types of things. All right. So those are some of the options that you have available to you if you're going to decide to be a bus driver and you want to move around and have different types of careers and those types of things. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. If you have any questions at all, I'll be more than happy to help you out with those and you know, answer your questions and discuss that. And of course, there's other smart drivers here as well who have 
other experience driving buses. All right, okay, so Sam is off. Krista, congrats on 94,000 subscribers. My road test is this week. I'm dyslexic with my rights and lefts. I get them mixed up. I hope they will be easy on me. Yes, uh, Krista, most of the time the examiners are really good, and especially if you tell them that you have dyslexia. And generally what we learn very quickly as driving examiners and uh, driving instructors is we say, you know, go left, go right. We always mo uh, motion with our hands because like you, Krista, I am right and left impaired and uh, I got a job telling people to go right and left. So <laughs> that's not just you, it's other people as well. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Philly, uh, in cl the Class C drivers pay little, if, you know, the, the, pay, the pay is not very good for school bus drivers. And that's not just in the States as well. Here in Canada, uh, that's not very, it's not very much as, at all for school bus drivers. So for a lot of people, driving a school bus is just not very, uh, it, you know, it just doesn't pay a lot of money. Uh, I was talking to a school bus driver here in British Columbia, and for whatever reason, this person managed to work as a school bus driver for a great length of time, 20 years or more than that. He was in the union and somehow managed to you know, retire with a full pension. So for some people, it does work out. For others, it doesn't. So, <laughs> Arion, I have some work to do. In terms of what do you have work to do there, Arion? Uh... Hillbilly, do, does Canada have some good unions? Yes, we have some good unions, especially if you're working for the transit authorities. They tend to have good unions. They tend to have fairly decent pay. And these are desirable jobs for people who are working for transit authorities. Some of these people go in there and they stay 20, 25, 30 years. I did some work in the late 90s for the London Transit Authority, London, Ontario, Canada. And this was the time when low floor, floor buses were coming in with the transit authorities and they were making their services accessible to people in wheelchairs and people with mobi mobility devices and those types of things. So we were, they hired me to develop a curriculum to teach drivers how to help people with disabilities, people who had hearing impairment, sight impairment, physical disabilities and those types of things and as well how to restrain the wheelchairs in the bus. So we did that as well. So, and I, you know, there were a lot of people there who had been uh, with the transit authority for a lot of years. So it is a fairly good job for a lot of people who are working there. Hillbilly, thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> the super chat, that is awesome. I just noticed that I, it must have gone up during the uh, presentation. Thank you again. I'm I'm very touched. Awesome. Okay, uh, Kate, you watched all your videos. You have your road test tomorrow, and and. Uh, good luck in your road test tomorrow. Definitely drop back and let us know uh, how that goes for you and how that turns out. And we wish you all the best. Okay, Douglas, I should look into bus driver. I bet it's a good way to pick up lots of women. Uh, <laughs> uh, Douglas, I wouldn't suggest that that be your main motive for becoming a bus driver. However, <laughs> saying that, I, I have heard a lot of tour bus drivers who have met women because you spend a lot of time with the same passengers on the vehicle. And I actually met uh, one person who I was in a driving instructor course with when I was in Australia. His wife was somebody that he met on the bus of a tour bus that he was driving. So it does happen, unfortunately. Not unfortunately, but it does happen. That's just what I'm saying. All right, Tommy, does Greyhound work uh, the same way in Australia as, as in the US? Uh, Tommy, I, I can't say definitively, but I think that Greyhound here in the United States and in Canada works the same as it did in Australia. It's regional work. You're gone for two or three days at a time. They're going to run you out to a hotel. You're going to stay there overnight. Uh, and another bus comes back. Uh, that driver will get off the bus, go into the hotel room, and you'll get on the bus and you'll bring it back the remainder of the way. So that tends to be the way that Greyhound works. Uh, for one of the runs that I was doing with Greyhound, it was the bus that ran between Brisbane and Melbourne. And basically we would take the bus from Melbourne to Parks, New South Wales, which was the halfway point uh, at Parks, New South Wales. Uh, we'd get off the bus, the bus would be fueled, and then the other driver would get on the bus and they would take it the remainder of the way. I think it was a, a 24 hour run from Melbourne to um, 
Melbourne to Brisbane, New, uh, Queensland. And so that's how that worked in terms of Greyhound. And as well, I know from my own experience that I did one time <laughs> take Greyhound from London, Ontario, Canada, all the way to Winnipeg, uh, out to where Corey lives. And uh, it was 36 hours on a Greyhound. And let me tell you, that is a long, long ride on a Greyhound. So, uh, yeah, that's the other thing that I did. Okay. Uh, Christian, love your videos, Rick. Always interesting. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, Liam, Rick, what does a bus truck driver do if someone stops in the way uh, in front of the stop line and they can't make the turn? Does this happen frequently? Uh, Liam, sometimes it does happen that they can't make the turn, but most of the time the bus or truck driver is going to be able to get that around there. And uh, Liam will tell you a funny story about not getting around somewhere. Uh, in Australia, <laughs> uh, was it, I think it was Bacchus Marsh with the V-Line, uh, it was one of the longer buses that we had and it was a very, fairly small roundabout and I remember that the roundabout was, there was a wire fence around the, the roundabout, not like a wire fence but those steel barricades that they have at parks and those types of things. Anyway, I got into this roundabout, it took me about six times of going in this roundabout before I could actually get the bus around without having to back up. But the first time I went around the roundabout, I got stuck in the roundabout and I had to back up to get the bus through the roundabout because uh, they had a big, you know, flowers and decorative things in the middle of the roundabout and I just couldn't get around the roundabout. And then I couldn't get the bus into reverse. It took me like a minute and a half to get the bus in reverse. And when you're sitting there blocking traffic in a large bus in a roundabout and you're trying to get, <laughs> trying to get it in 90 seconds seems like an eternity. And finally got it into reverse, got it backed up and around the corner. And I've had the same thing with trucks where I've gone around the corner and I've misjudged it or something like that. And you have to back up to get the, the, the truck around the corner. It does happen, but eventually the, the driver figures it out. They figure out how to back up and get the thing around the corner, those types of things, okay? Uh, Krista, thank you. You're the best driving teacher on YouTube. Thank you so much, Krista. <laughs> we do what we can and, uh, you know, we're working hard here. And uh, just on that note, Krista, and everybody else here watching the live stream, everybody watching the replay, I have put a poll up on the community tab there, and I've asked smart drivers whether they want me to work on videos for truck driver training or motorcycle training with the coming spring. And uh, whatever that poll says, that's where I'm going to go. I'm either going to do truck driver training videos or I'm going to do motorcycle training videos. So be sure to head over to the community tab there cast your vote and help me out with providing the videos that you want to watch and that will help you out with your new uh your quest for your license in whatever class of license you're going to get okay Jaden, hello my friend from florida how are you i'm about to get my permit soon my dad said i can't get it unless i learn how to practice parking perfectly and he said on my practice my driving at the driving arena so yes Jaden. so Jaden, what I'm going to suggest you is to go and get some of those 36 inch uh, delineators and go to the parking lot and work with those. And Corey will get the video up for you on the Ohio maneuverability test. Work on that exercise, Jaden, and that will really, really help you with your driving and your backing up and your mirrors and uh, improve your overall driving as well, okay? King, uh, hey Rick, I passed my class D test about a year back and never really thanked you. I still watch your videos and constantly try to be a better driver. Keep up the awesome work, friend. Excellent. That is awesome, King. And Class D, uh, for those of you, so I'm assuming, King, that you're in Ontario because uh, I don't know any other place that has a Class D license. But Class D license is a five-ton truck. Uh, two Here in British Columbia, it's two axles on the back of the truck. It's like a dump truck uh, is the best example of a Class D license. I want to thank King for his success in getting his license and letting us know. And I'm continued patronage of the channel here. And uh, I just want to say <laughs> I made the mistake uh, of a few, a couple of months back now on the channel saying that a lot of people come to the Smart Drive Test channel. They, they only stay for six or eight weeks and then they're gone because they got their license and they don't really have you know, they don't really stick around after that because they got their license, they got what they needed. But I was incredibly wrong about that. I had a lot of smart drivers say to me that, no, I'm still here. I've been here for a year and a half. I've been here for two years. Like King just said, I uh, got his license a year ago. He's still here. He's on the live stream. He's participating. 
uh, continued patronage of the Smart Drive Test channel. And I just, you know, for all of you here now, all of you watching on the replay, I can't thank you enough for your continued support of the Smart Drive Test channel, of this endeavor, of me being an entrepreneur, because it just really, you know, makes me proud that this is actually working. And uh, like I said, you know, when I started this three years ago, I can remember saying to a really good friend of mine, uh, you know, Pastor Yoda, as I call him, my friend Tim, who basic Joomla tutorials, I, you know, I said to him, I said, nobody will ever watch this. And uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. So thank you so much for that. Cody, remember to hit the like button if you like the stream to support the channel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Cody. Uh, Hillbilly motorcycle license is a no-brainer. Would not recommend a motorcycle license. Too many friends have fatal axe crashes. Yes, Hillbilly, that is true. Uh, you're 35 times more likely to be killed on a motorcycle than any other vehicle on the roadway. And so your risk of being involved in a motorcycle crash and being seriously injured or killed is is high. There's there's absolutely no doubt about it. So if people are thinking about getting a motorcycle license, I cannot stress enough, go and take a motorcycle training course. It pays dividends and it will make you aware of the risks on the roadway and it will give you information for you to keep yourself safe on the roadway uh, because there's just there's just too many things and as I said in the video that I published last week about the rear end crash about uh, Esther running into somebody else you don't know what you don't know so know that as well okay Gil is speaking from Brazil. That's awesome. Tommy, uh, thanks for doing tonight's topic. You're most welcome, Tommy. Uh, anything we can do. Uh, Gil, good night. Want to congratulate you on your work. For me, whose dream of driving truck in Canada, his work is of the utmost importance. Thank you for your great work. You are most welcome, Gil. Thank you for your compliment. That's awesome. All right, Vinny, any new stories lately? Uh, Vinny, I've always got stories for you, my friend. Okay, uh, Hillbilly, I'm in Philly and local school test in 47 foot. I feel 53 is too big for my temperament. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Most of the standard size of semi-trailers is 53 feet. A lot of driving schools are going to take you out on a 40 foot, uh, 48 foot trailer, uh, which is just a little bit easier for students as opposed to a 53 because that extra 5 feet makes a big difference for CDL drivers uh, who are driving uh, coaches. Now, uh, let me see. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a bus story for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Man Pinder, my brother is going to start his bus driving training with Toronto Transit Commission. I would re recommend your videos to him, especially air brake ones. Yes, Man Pinder, if we can help out in any way. Uh, and also, the air brake course is available over at the Smart Drive Test website. That'll help him out as well. All right. So, yes, I do have a story for you. Uh, Vinny, and this ties into transit bus drivers. Now, uh, as I was saying to Philly there, I do consulting work, uh, and I work for the legal profession doing crash analysis. And I was approached by a, a personal injury law firm. Uh, it was about a year ago now. Three years ago, there was a crash in Ontario in one of the metropolitan cities with one of the transit authorities. And essentially what had happened... The, the bus driver pulled up, stopped on the roadway, and passengers got off the bus. Young teenager got off the bus, got off the front of the bus, walked around the front of the bus, because where the, the teenager was going, there was an entrance into a suburb back off this way from where the bus was. So the bus was here and where the teenager was going back here. And so what happened was is the teenager got off the front of the bus, walked, stepped out in front of the other lane of traffic, and got hit by a pickup truck and essentially the type of crash that happened was is that when this the teenager stepped out in front of the other pickup truck he didn't get hit directly head on essentially what happened was is he hit the corner of the pickup truck it's called a fender wrap and essentially the body wraps around the fender and goes up and he hit his head on the windshield right at the post where the windshield connects with the body of the truck cracked the windshield through the teenager 50 feet and little doubt the teenager sustained brain injury and was in hospital for a long period of time. So the personal injury law firm acquired my services as a consultant and said, listen, we're going after the transit authority and we believe that the transit authority is 
responsible for this crash. So I started investigating the records that were provided to me. What I found out was is that the, the bus driver had previously been a school bus driver, had received no training to be a transit bus driver. And there's a great deal of difference between being a transit bus driver and being a school bus driver. And eventually what had happened was is that there was a gravel pullout, but the bus driver was insistent that buses don't pull off the roadway, uh, that they have to remain on the roadway to alight passengers. Well, this was false because it says, you know, the definition of what a pullout is is not defined, that it's a pavement and it's constructed with curbs and those types of things. And so the law firm went out and put a camera up for a full day a ha approximately half the bus is pulled into the pullout and every time the bus is pulled into the pullout and pedestrians or passengers on the bus were going to this entrance into the suburb they would get off the bus they'd walk around the back of the bus and and cross the roadway so the bus driver didn't pull into the pull into the pullout the other thing that the bus driver failed to do was that didn't pull up to the sign so most of us who ride transit buses note that when transit drivers let passengers off they pull the front door right up to the transit sign where this where the bus stop is located and the bus driver didn't do that stayed back about 30 feet and because two things so two factors that the bus driver made the mistake first the bus driver stayed on the road and didn't pull into the pullout and second the bus driver stayed back from the sign about 30 feet in doing that the bus driver created a path that was much shorter to go around the front of the bus than it was to go around the rear of the bus the teenager got off the front of the bus and stepped out in front of a pickup truck and got cleaned up. And the personal injury, injury lawyers were actually able to assign culpability to both the transit authority and the bus driver because the transit authority could not provide any records that they had provided basic defensive driving and policies and procedures for where to stop the bus when alighting passengers. So that's one of the stories for you in terms of driving a bus. All right, Hillbilly, I'm going for class B. I'm 50 years old. Uh, big cities you can't do, TT. This is a retirement job. There you go. Excellent. Uh, Douglas, sounds like someone wasn't using their Smith keys. Uh, wasn't using Douglas, and it was worse than that because the bus driver admitted not to checking mirrors before bringing the vehicle to a stop. And for any of us that know defensive driving, we know that before you bring a vehicle to us, before you start to slow a vehicle down or bring it to a stop, you check the mirrors to figure out what's behind you, to figure somebody's tailgating you or not. Before you bring the vehicle to a stop, the bus driver didn't even check the mirrors to see if anybody was behind the vehicle before they brought it to a stop. And I was just like, they're basically admitting guilt. The other piece of information and I know I know that probably a lot of drivers don't know this information a lot of drivers are under the misconception that a solid yellow line means that you can't pass which is not true a solid yellow line here in North America means that you can pass but pass with caution and it was a solid yellow line uh, and the driver was said well that means you can't pass and that's not true if you look in the manuals that's what it means so uh, that was one of the other stories about a fatality with a transit bus driver so know that if something happens to the passengers because a lot of transit authorities will say to transit bus drivers once a passenger gets off the bus they're not our responsibility however the bus driver and the transit authority both have a responsibility to facilitate the safe transition from the bus to wherever they're going so in other words you can't just drop them off on the roadway because that's not a safe transition for them to transition from being passenger to pedestrian. So transit authorities are responsible for that transition. This is why we have bus bays. This is why we have uh, designated bus stops for transit authorities. So they are responsible for that transition. So that's the other piece about that as well. Okay, and uh, a couple people here, uh, Sam and Douglas are both talking about the Smith Space Cushion System, which was developed by Harold, uh, Harold Smith in the late 1940s, 1950s. It's been around for a long time. Basically, it's the five components of the Smith Space Cushion System. Uh, make sure they see you, leave yourself an out, aim high in your steering. Uh, <laughs> I always miss one or two of these, and I'm sure other people are going to say. So, leave yourself an out, 
aim high in your steering, keep your eyes moving, uh, look far down the road, and <laughs> I always miss one. I always miss one. But we basically can't teach it anymore because Harold died, his family took it over, and it's been patented, so a lot of driving schools can't do it. But we still teach it. It is still the fundamentals of basic defensive driving and will help you out. And if you do take a defensive driving course, they're going to teach you those five tenets of the Smith Space Cushion System. And they've tried to come up with all kinds of variations of the Smith Space Cushion System. It doesn't work. They come up with SIPD. They come up with IPD. Uh, <laughs> ICBC here in British Columbia came up with a great one. See, think, do. That's, that's just really, uh, really awesome. So... <laughs> I try not to make fun of that one because it just see, think, do, whatever that means. Uh, it's just it's so funny that they spent a lot of money, I'm sure, coming up with that. Okay. Uh, okay, so Jaden, I missed your comment. Sorry about that. Here, I'll just have a look and see. Okay, uh, this is part of the topic of buses. So when my bus driver picked up my friend from school, the door was working. But for me, uh, the door just stopped. Okay, so if the door is not working on the bus, Jaden... And for whatever reason, uh, the bus is at that juncture is out of service and the bus driver has to get it fixed. So I don't know what was going on there with that. There we go. So Sam has bailed me out here in terms of the five tenets of the Smith Space Christian system. Aim high in your steering. Get the big picture. Keep your eyes moving. Leave yourself an out and make sure they see you. So if other road users don't see you, make sure you get eye contact or you wave your hand or something like that. So those, those are the five tenets. Thank you, Sam, for helping with that. For some reason, I always miss one. Okay, Tommy, uh, my plan after I get my Class B CDL driver's is to, uh, dump truck or even a garbage truck driver to get my experience, then hopefully become a bus driver. Excellent. And Tommy, uh, one of the other things I might counsel you on is if you can come up with the money and the extra time and you think that you can do it, I would counsel you to get a, a Class 1 or Class A license, a tractor trailer license. Because if you're going to go on to drive a uh, truck, uh, say a dump truck, for example, you're going to work for an excavating company. Most dump trucks are going to pull pups, especially here in British Columbia and other places in North America. And a pup is another trailer behind the dump truck. As soon as you put a, a pup on a dump truck, you're now looking at a class one license. And these excavating companies have had the, um, the luxury in the last few years to just hire class one licenses. Because if some one of the drivers calls in sick and they're on one of these trucks and pups and need a class one license, when they start going down the list of drivers, they don't want to, you know, Pete and Bill and da and Sheila and Todd and Edna can all drive class one vehicles, but the rest of the drivers can't. Rather, they're just going to start at the top of the list and start going down until they find a replacement driver. So it's a lot easier for them to hire class one licenses. So if you can figure out how to do that and get a class one license, you're going to be much more employable uh, than if you just have a, a straight truck license. So that I might counsel if you can figure that out, then I, I would suggest you do that. Okay, Sean, I'm a truck driver for U.S. Foods out of Perth, Amboy, New Jersey, Class A, but I want, I watched your videos while I was getting my CDL license. Thank you so much. Awesome. And so you're hauling uh, groceries, Sean. How do you find hauling groceries? Because, uh, you know, I did most everything when I drove truck, but the couple of times that I drove groceries, I really did not like driving hauling groceries. And the reason, though, just one reason why I didn't like hauling groceries, I didn't like breaking down the pallets. And uh, just to explain to you, for those of you who are non-truck drivers, not hauling groceries, breaking down the pallets. So, for example, uh, when they put the pallets on the truck, for example, if you're hauling cookies, cookies aren't very heavy. So they fill the truck to the brim. So the pallets are stacked floor to ceiling in the truck. But when you bring them off the truck into the loading dock, into the warehouse, the grocery warehouse, the pallets won't fit on the shelves in the warehouse. So the driver is responsible for breaking the pallets down. So basically you take one pallet and make it into two pallets, essentially. And when I was hauling grocery, uh, I didn't get paid extra for that as an over-the-road truck driver. I mean, it's different if you're a city driver or a regional driver. Maybe you're getting haul getting paid by the hour. Then that's okay. But I, <laughs> I wasn't getting paid any extra to do two or three hours of work of breaking down all these pallets and over-the-road truck drivers. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't really like hauling groceries. Uh, too much. Okay. Uh, okay, Sean, uh, off topic question. What did you get your PhD in? And thanks. Okay, so Sean, my PhD is in legal history. And for those of you who don't know, legal history is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in 
uh, policing as it relates to traffic. So essentially what I did was I looked at the 40 year period between 1890 and 1930, which is essentially the transition years between horse-drawn traffic and motor traffic and how policing and law changed to facilitate higher road speeds because essentially what happened as we moved from horse-drawn traffic to motor traffic, average road speeds went from six miles an hour on average to 30 miles an hour on average, which is essentially today saying, what year are we in? So say it's 2020. So by 2060, we would all be driving around cities at 250 kilometers an hour, which most of us are like, oh my God, that's crazy. But essentially from 1890, relatively speaking, from 1890 to 1930, that's what happened on the streets uh, in the world of all major cities. So policing and law changed a lot to try and facilitate that increased flow of traffic. As well, roadways went from a social space to being monopolized by motor cars. So how to reduce the number of traffic crashes and those types of things. And basically what I argue is, is that uh, rather than try and facilitate safety and order maintenance, traffic laws and infrastructure move to facilitate higher road speeds because we wanted this higher road speed and that's what happened. So that's essentially my PhD in a, in a nutshell. Okay, uh, Jonathan, I already have my class B. I'm now working more than normal hours because of the school bus shortage where I work. So it's more money for me, which I'm not complaining against. Excellent, so that's great. You're making lots of money. <laughs> uh, Jaden, uh, once we turned off the bus, we turned it back on, the alarm went off, so we transferred to another bus. Okay, so everything worked out and you got into another bus, Jaden. That's great. Uh, Cody, what would you say is the number one reason why drivers fail their road test? Uh, the number one reason that I would say drivers fail their road test, Cody, is because they're simply not prepared. They simply didn't do enough work prior to going in for the road test. They just don't have enough experience to be able to uh, proficiently handle the vehicle in changing traffic situations. And as well... Now, I don't know whether we're talking about a CDL license or we're talking about a passenger vehicle license. The other thing about passenger vehicle licenses is that seven-eighths of the road test is in a forward motion, one-eighth is in a reverse motion, which is your, your parallel parking, uh, reverse two-point turn, three-point turns, uh, reverse stall parking, those types of things. Those, that one-seventh of the tent, uh, one-seventh of the test, the slow speed maneuvers, that is what's gonna give passenger vehicle drivers the most grief. So. And the other irony of that is that one seventh of the test, the slow speed maneuvers, if you're good and proficient at those slow speed maneuvers, you're going to be a better driver overall. So that's the other thing that I tell you to do in preparation for a test, practice those slow speed maneuvers, and that's going to make you a better driver overall. Okay. Uh, Sean, I love it because although the work is hard, I get home every day, I make about the same money as over the road. And that that's excellent, Sean. That is a great reason to haul groceries because you're home every day, you're making approximately the same money you would otherwise. You know, you're working hard, you're, you're tired at the end of the day, you put in a good day's work, and like you said, you're home every night and you're getting paid the same work. That's really great, I'm glad that you like it. Uh, which alarm? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's for Vinny. Okay, let's let's talk about alarms. So in the Greyhound bus on an overnight coming from Canberra, Australia, back to Melbourne, had an, a bus and they have those little hammers in the bus and they say on the hammer, in case of emergency, use to break glass. Well, those little hammers that are in the holder, they're on an alarm. And so one night we're coming back and <laughs> the stupid, the, the holder was broken on the bus and it had been going for a little bit. I'd driven that bus two or three times. And so this one night it just, the hammer wouldn't stay in the holder and the alarm goes off and the alarm's in the, in the instrument panel. And it's three hours of because I wasn't going to stop. <laughs> I was going to wait until I got to the rest area. So it was three hours before we got to the rest area of listening to this buzzer all the way there. And then finally, when I got there, as much duct tape as I could, because of course, in my toolkit that I had was duct tape and duct tape this thing back into the holder to get the alarm to turn off <laughs> on the bus. So there's never a dull moment driving transit buses or you know dealing with machinery and passengers and those types of things. Okay, uh, uh, 
Okay, Jonathan, special needs kids I dealt with are most quiet, but when I dealt with non-special needs kids, all oh, the noise. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Douglas, higher speeds needs equivalency, prime and Schneider. Example, become a hazard in certain situations. Uh, yeah, there are some, unfortunately, companies that are notorious for taking on uh, rookie drivers, and yes, they do have some difficulties with those. Okay, uh... <clears throat> So Sam is writing up some of the kids. Yes, so you do have difficulty with passengers on the bus. And uh, <laughs> Jonathan asked Sam if they were driving his bus. And uh, <clears throat> I was telling you, I'll just tell you one more story for Vinny here. Uh, and this ties into a story I was telling a couple of weeks ago about dealing with passengers on the bus who were sick. And I got to the point on driving Greyhound bus that I was completely intolerant of passengers who had been drinking. So I'm in Sydney, I'm in Sydney, Australia, I'm at the terminal, I'm loading, and uh, I see these two guys standing over at the back, and I know that they've been drinking. So I went up to them and I said, listen, hey guys, I know you've been drinking. I said, don't deny it, I know you have. I said, listen, you're gonna be on the bus. I said, consider this your first warning. I said, I'm not warning you again. If I have difficulty with you on the bus, you're off the bus. And so everybody got on the bus. We're going to, it's the milk run through Sydney, Australia. And the milk run uh, went through Parramatta. And for those of you who may or may not be familiar with Sydney, Australia, Parramatta is kind of in the middle. And then Liverpool's way on the outskirts. It's one of the outer suburbs of Sydney, Australia. And it's <laughs> literally, it's 45 minutes to drive through Sydney, Australia on the milk run. And we get out near Liverpool and this bus... <laughs> that I was driving, and this is another thing about driving buses for Greyhound, uh, this bus was notorious that when they cleaned out the septic tank in the toilet and they put new chemical in it, that it would overflow. Not a lot, but enough, you know, the chemical would flow into the bus. So the chemical overflowed, we're, I don't know, we're about 10 blocks from the stop in Liverpool, and this guy who I had given the warning to is up in the bus and he's running up and down the bus. The toilet's overflowing. The toilet's overflowing. The toilet's overflowing. And I'm like, I'm stopped at the traffic light and I look back and I said, sir, you're going to have to sit down. I said, you have to sit down. You have to fasten your seatbelt because buses and sure I had seatbelts on them. I said, you have to fasten your seatbelt. If you don't fasten your seatbelt, I can't go anywhere. And so he sits down. The light's just about to change. Not two two seconds later, he's up and he's running up and down the aisle. The toilet's overflowing. The toilet. I, said, I said to him, I said, listen, mate. I said, if you don't stop, you don't sit down right now, you're getting off at the next stop. He didn't stop and he wouldn't sit down. So we get to the traffic light and as some of you who are bus drivers know, the best way to get passengers to sit down on the bus when the bus isn't moving at a traffic light is to simply let the, the light cycle through. So the light goes to red, it goes to green, cycles back to yellow, goes back to red. By the time I got back to green, the rest of the passengers are screaming at him to sit down. He finally sits down, and we're not another block up the road, the same thing. He's running up and down the, the aisle. The toilet's overflowed, the toilet's overflowed. So finally we get to the bus stop. I said to him, I said, listen, mate, you gotta get off. I said, you're just, you're just a pain. And then he won't show me which bag is his because you can't kick him off the bus without their luggage. So finally, he wouldn't show me which bag it was. I called the police. The police, it's not a big priority for the police. They're like, we'll be there in an hour. So I get back on the bus and I say to the rest of the passengers, said, listen, he's not going to show me his bag. I said, you might as well get off, have a cigarette, do whatever, go get a coffee. Because they said, we're going to be here at least an hour before he shows me his bag. And uh, finally, there's nothing better than 35 other passengers standing around staring you down and finally took about 10 minutes. I got the bus all cleaned up. I got the floor mopped up and the toilet cleaned and those types of things. And uh, he comes back on, he says, I'll show you which bag it is. So I opened the bin, he showed me which bag it is, I threw it off. And uh, so everybody got back on the bus and we carried on. And the bus, it was a straight run back to Melbourne. Well, unfortunately, while I was dealing with all of this nonsense, somebody came up to me and they said, oh, here's my bus, here's my ticket. I didn't really look at it. I just, yep, get on the bus. And uh, oh, the fiasco wasn't quite over yet, so we're going down the highway, and this passenger who got on the bus in Liverpool says to me, she says, uh, I'm going to Canberra. Are, are we going to Canberra? I said, no, we're not going to Canberra. We're just going to Melbourne. So anyway, so she got on the wrong bus, 
And uh, so I let her off at the fuel station and I said, oh, I don't know how you're going to get to Canberra, but I said, I'm sorry, I can't take you there. There's another bus. Maybe I can get you hooked up with that bus or whatnot. So anyway, it was kind of a fiasco of a night. And uh, sometimes you do what Sam was saying here, that you have to kick passengers off the bus. If they're being unruly, they're being unsafe, those types of things, uh, that's what you need to do with passengers and those types of things. <laughs> so it happens. All right, so if I didn't answer anybody's question, if you're watching on the replay, you know, again, let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know what class of license you're going for. If you are considering a, a career as a bus driver, lots of great options available to you. We're running down here to the end. And uh, for all those people in the last couple of weeks, all the smart drivers who have passed the road test, uh, congratulations on doing that. And if you have a road test coming up, good luck on that. And again, you know, if you're new to smart drive test, consider subscribing, hit that thumbs up button and share us around on social media. All that helps out drivers who are going for a license and drivers who want to uh, be safer, be smarter drivers. And again, head over to the smart drive test website and Corey will put the uh, checklist up for you uh, for uh, the defensive driving checklist that will help you out there. And the link Corey is www.smartdrivetest.com slash dd hyphen checklist and that'll get that for you as well okay <clears throat> okay and sam put up his channel there as well i think that it did come up uh for sam driving lessons by big mac sam so check out sam's channel as well and support sam and as i said sam is in the bronx there in new york city uh, driving lessons by Big Mac Sam and that'll help you out uh, as well. Sam's got some really great information for tests in New York City and some of the criteria and things that you should and should not do <laughs> for your road test down there. Uh, there we go. Epic. Uh, rode on a school bus and one time the driver had to go back to the back of the bus to reset a buzzing alarm. I was wondering if it was for air brakes. Uh, class A or B? gross vehicle weight uh epic probably what that was for is if there was an alarm going off sometimes the all of the doors the emergency doors and windows are all on alarms and this is something you have to check as part of your pre-trip inspection and if the door or window is slightly ajar it'll cause the alarm to go off so that's probably what the bus driver had done was going back uh and reset the door or reset the window to get the alarm to go off as well all right there we go. There's the checklist. Corey put that up for you. Uh, okay, so Sam was a drive. He's a driving instructor currently in New York City, and he drove a bus for a senior set a senior center. Okay, Cody, <laughs> I love you, Rick. Excellent. We love you too, Cody. Thank you very much for being part of the Smart Drive Test community. Okay, and again, uh, Sam, I don't know whether we put that up there for you but um just send me the link for your channel again sam and i'll make sure that that gets up here in the comments and then people can check that out for you as well uh liam by big mac sam where do you like to take your students to practice excellent okay so i think we're going to wrap it up there and uh sam will put up his link there and he'll have that to his website uh, again get your uh defensive driving checklist i'll put that down in the comments there for you so head down there head over to the smart drive test website and get that as well lots of other good information over at the smart drive test website as well uh, all of that will help you out leave a comment let us know where you're tuning in from especially if you're watching on the replay congratulations to all those smart drivers in the last couple of weeks who have passed their road test good luck to those of you who are taking your road test in the next week or so and uh thanks very much for tuning in all the best i'm rick with smart drive test good luck on your road test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer have a great night bye now